what does transformation healing meaning to you? What challenging have you overcome in your life that transformed who you are today? Good morning, everyone. It is Tuesday. Welcome to our Transformation Healing Podcast. I'm your host, Ria Wang, a certified transformation healing coach, a spiritual mentor. I help my clients go through the transformation healing and the spiritual awakening to transform the limitation, connect with the true self to become best version of the self. In the past years, I have been traveling around the world to interview, to study, to share how transformation healing can change in our lives. And in this podcast, my guests come from all over the world. They come to here to share the inspiration story, the wisdom that can help you to uh, can help you to gather tips in your daily life to implement that in your daily life. Today, I have amazing guests. Linda, Linda, welcome to our Transformation Healing Podcast. Thank you, Ria. It's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to see you again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Linda. It's so great to have you. I love you. Sunset uh, background. It looks so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to introduce a little bit about Linda. Put my glass on first so I can read it clear. <laughs> so <laughs> Linda was one of the first three non-aging women in Northern America to become a Feng Shui master. Wow, the first three non-aging women become Feng Shui master. And also Linda is international recognized award winner, speaker, and author. Linda educated, motivated, inspired, empowered, and transform her audience. Having discovered her home was cast her illness and heartbreaking. Um, she searched for answer that lead her into the world of the Feng Shui over 35 years ago. Linda's passion is to create the beautiful, functional, healthy, happy, and harmonic environment for the home, work, and life. Well, welcome to Linda. Linda, you are just <laughs> tell us a little bit. I know you love to share the inside about how environment can affect our physical, mental, emotional, and the spiritual. That's the whole total well-being, right, Linda? Yes, definitely. <laughs> Uh, before you start, I would like you share, uh, tell us where you are now at this point, where you are in the world. Because where am of, I? <laughs> our audience, our speaker come from all over the world. Well, I used to live in California for over 70 years of my life. And four years ago, I moved to Washington State. And the background that you see is literally what I get to view out my office window on summer solstice. Uh, this is Vancouver Island in the background with the sun setting. It's, um, it's just magical. So obviously, uh, I've recently been able to enjoy that again. And uh, Washington State, um, I love California, and, and that is my home in many, many ways. And yet, moving to Washington State with all of nature has just fed my soul. Um, so I get to be with bald eagles and all sorts of birds and have time to enjoy them. So that's where I'm at now. Wow, I'm jealous. Just see that sunset. Come and visit. <laughs> Definitely, I will come visit you. So Linda, we know you are the, you've been doing the feng shui for 35 years. I was, when I first time meet you, I was like, wow, I never, you know, I'm the Chinese. We talk about the feng shui all the time. So we grew up in the environment, almost everybody. So aware about the, what is the feng shui. But in the Western, that still have some challenging people. Is that correct? Absolutely, yes. 
um, a lot of people don't believe in feng shui for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's a preconceived idea that uh, that they have. Sometimes it is something that they believe is a religion and it is against their religion. So there may be some conflict there. I personally, when I first was introduced to it, was having issues not only because of uh, the first class, first school that I learned was Buddhist feng shui. And having been raised in the Judeo Christian background, you know, I was butting heads with that. But there was also in the interior design part of it, it was like, you know, I'm not going to put all sorts of what I would call tchotchkes, um, you know, crystals and f bamboo flutes and all sorts of different things all around my house because that's not who I was. So it was quite a learning process, but that also is what a lot of people have as a belief system or a perception of feng shui. Mm. Yeah, that, that is interesting. So you say you was doesn't put a crystal. I have a crystal all over my place. <laughs> Well, I do too, but that wasn't me at that point in time. <laughs> I'm, I know. So tell, tell us a little bit about the, your challenge because we talk about the transformation healing. So what does the transformation healing mean to you from your personal or your business? I know everybody come to this show, everyone have to go through, have been through the challenge in their, in their life. That's how do they become who they are today. Share a little bit, a bit about the, your journey of you. Well, I'm going to give you a little bit of background of how I got into the feng shui with, and then explain how I wind up using it now. Um, mm -hmm. I have an interior design background. I wanted to decorate my own home. I started taking some classes. I met some ladies. We decided that we would start our own business in interior design so that we could buy the furniture at wholesale prices. <laughs> Great idea, but we weren't being taught about how to run an actual business. And so we, I finally found a trade show that was about running a small design firm. I went there, it was six days long. I was dressed in my designer outfits. This was in the mid eighties. And at that point, the fashion trend, and as a designer, I needed to do that, was to wear four inch pointed toe shoes. So I was walking around on cement floors in those four inch pointed toe shoes. My feet were killing me. Fast forward, the last day, I'm sitting down in the auditorium. I walk into this room, thinking it's something about interior design, not paying any attention to speak of. And ultimately, a gentleman walked in who was dressed in a black robe, had six people behind him in a processional. He started to speak. It was on feng shui. He only spoke Mandarin. Thank God there was a translator. <laughs> it was quite an experience, and it was extremely uncomfortable for me. He would say good feng shui, bad feng shui. He had transparencies. That was the technology back then. All of a sudden, he takes uh, out a clean transparency, draws, puts it on the projector. The translator says something about bad feng shui to the point that a child could die. Mm. What the, what the wow. master, and the master was Grandmaster Lin Yun. What the master had drawn was a house and a floor plan with a bedroom. And it looked very much like my home. And my son, Jeff, had died just a few months before that. Oh my gosh. I that was my introduction. All over me. Well, I had them, but they weren't the good kind. <laughs> it was, it's very hard to explain, but I think that a lot of people will get a general sense of it mm -hmm. because here was something, a, a foreign, culture, a foreign speaking individual, something that was very raw in my life with the death of my son. And here's a drawing that says, and you want a gentleman that doesn't know me, no one in this place knows me, saying something to the effect that basically I had put my son into a room and placed his bed in this location and it caused his death. That's a lot for a person. I think to that is so heavy to, for the mom to hear about that. Definitely. I can't just can't probably a lot of people can handle with that. Just hear that shocking. Exactly. Exactly. And at that point, my life changed. It was what is this thing called feng shui? What could it possibly have had to do with my son's health and death? And, you know, how do I prevent this from ever happening to anyone else so that there isn't another parent out there that 
that has that same experience. I mean, it's bad enough if a child dies, excuse me, if a child dies, but to be told that the configuration of the home, that sacred place of ours, that place that we're supposed to be safe and secure and nurturing could actually have created this situation. It was just beyond belief. It was beyond what I could comprehend. Um, I did finally find a place where I could study it. Um, it has definitely changed my life. What I wind up doing, my passion is to help people to understand what feng shui is, how to change their home without you know, having to do remodeling, uh, not spending a lot of money, to make sure that that house that they are living in that is their home is a sanctuary, is a place that nurtures them, that is healthy for them, it doesn't have toxic fumes. It also doesn't have arrangements or architectural features within it that could in any way, shape or form negatively affect a person's life you know, or a family's life. So that is my passion, that is my purpose in life. And I'm so grateful because a few times I've literally gone into people's homes. I've seen something that from a feng shui perspective is not right. I've been able to tell them to change things. And in fact, I have one young, uh, well, she's probably in her mid twenties now, but at the time she was like five years old. She'd been told that she had to have heart surgery. Her mom had actually called me in to um, help them with some finances. But when I saw the room, I said, oh, we've got to do some different things here. And I told her to paint it different colors. And she was scheduled to have surgery at the Stanford Hospital uh, at the time I lived not too far from, from Stanford. This uh, five-year-old girl was to have open heart surgery, but she still had to wait about five to six months before she was old enough for them to be able to do it. They knew that you know, it wasn't life-threatening or immediately life-threatening, but it was something that needed to be addressed. And so I told her what to do within her bedroom, you know, within the child's bedroom, and she did it. And when she went for the pre-op um, um, exam, they didn't find the problem. She did not have to go through that heart surgery at all. She was healed. Now, I'm not saying that what I did created the healing. I may have contributed to it. It may have been what I suggested that changed it. I don't know. But when I've had experiences time after time where something isn't right, I tell them to change it giving them several ideas. So, so that's something that works for them. You know, it's, it's not like one, shoot, one size fits all. It's like, well, here are some options. What sounds good to you? And then they get to make the decision as to what, what works for their design, what works from their aesthetics, uh, from their personal belief system uh, in the overall scheme of things. You know, maybe it's color, maybe they don't like what would normally be used as a color, but we've got other vibra vibrational energies that we can use to change that. So that's what I love to do is to find, be a detective, find what's going on, and then give a variety of solutions and let them create from their their heart what will serve you know serve them and serve the purpose. Wow! Thank you, Linda. Thank you for sharing your stories. That's so inspiring. And uh, sorry for your loss. Um, and uh, yes, like you said, so what do they believe? This is all about belief. We talk about how the energy fo uh, follow with the, your intention. So when you start seeking, when you start seeking, that's something will be showing up. Even something is real in there, in front of you, but you still blind it. You don't want to look at it. So that, of course, wouldn't come to help you. I think all of this, the feng shui, the energy work, all of the healings is fortunately we do have amazing tool in that we can use to help we changing our lives, changing our environment, changing our food, changing everything. If you start seeking to want to live in the life with the healthy balance, use the natural way there. It's available, many tools. It's yes, there, yes. Right? And seeing your singing bowls, one of the um, things that I do when I'm doing a space clearing of a home is I will use a singing bowl to change the vibration of the environment. And as you mentioned earlier, when you when you become aware of something, oh, lovely, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
when you become aware of something, whether it's something that you want or don't want, becoming aware is the first step. And then we can make choices from there as to what we want to do. If it's something that we don't want in our life, then we can focus in on something that we do want. If it's something that we want and it's not manifesting the way that we think it should, then sometimes we look at our own belief systems. Sometimes we look at what we have around us. And that's one of the things that often happens in feng shui is that a person is trying to move forward they're doing all the different things. They may have a coach. They may have uh, using affirmations, any number of different tools. And sometimes there's still something in the environment that's holding them back. It may be a book that someone gave them that um, really doesn't support them energetically. It's, it doesn't have the same vibration. It doesn't have the same beliefs that they have. Or it may be an object that they were gifted or that they've inherited that doesn't have good energy. I'll tell you another quick story. There was a lady who was in a, uh, was trying to sell her home. And this was probably 25 or so years ago. She had a $6,000 mortgage trying to sell her house. That gives you maybe an idea of, you know, 25 years ago, $6,000 mortgage. It was a big, beautiful house. But she'd gone through a divorce. She needed to sell the house. She was about to lose the house. And every time I walked in, I just kind of felt, you know, you were talking about, oh, you got goosebumps. Well, there's the good goosebumps or God bumps. There's also those ones where the hair stands up on the back of your neck. You know, you go, <laughs> oh, yes. Well, I kept walking into this house and I kept having the hair on the back of my neck. And I go, oh. and there was this huge piece of jade. Uh, by the door. Finally, I asked her to tell me about it. She said, oh, I hate that piece, but I want it in the divorce. And I go, oh. oh. oh you may hear that. I feel the goosebump already. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And you know, that's a good sign because, I mean, when you get that goosebump, those goosebumps, you know, it tells you there's something real about this. You don't just walk around and get goosebumps all the time. <laughs> At least I don't. Didn't. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you know, I told her, get rid of it. And when she did get rid of it within a couple of weeks and she had enough money, she could have kept the house, but she chose to sell the house and she moved to a different location. But sometimes we have an object that we feel like we need to keep for some reason or it has some kind of negative energy. If we start with the beginning, it's even the beginning because she wants to keep because she hated, but she wants to keep that is that already create a complex con collect energy there, right? So yes. something you hate the way you want to uh, keep that because the reasons because divorce because something revenge or whatever so that the energy is already created it's not good energy there <laughs> <laughs> and you know it, it's a, a conflict of energy but i don't think that she ever looked at it that way mm -hmm. and that's what happens with most of us we don't look at yeah. things from that perspective so if for someone going through a transition or they're wanting to make some kind of change in their um their life but it's not happening i'd suggest go through and analyze the different things that might have a relationship to that for instance if you want money but you you don't give to other people you hoard things um that's a conflict of energy where you know with it's the giving and the receiving that we're looking at when we want more of something yeah. uh if you're looking for love do you love other people? Do you open your heart to them? Do you have something that you despise in your space, but you didn't really realize it or something that reminds you of a relationship that was very closed? And so looking at each object that we have, you know, and obviously you can't go through every single thing, but look at some of the main things and look at things in your bedroom or in your office or in the place where you spend most of your time or in the kitchen. Look at the different things there and see how you feel. You know, does this, you know, going back to um, Marie Kondo's, what brings you joy? Well, it's more than just getting rid of things for clutter. It's what brings you joy in general. And if it doesn't bring you joy, is it something that's functional that you need to keep from that perspective? If not, then why do you have it? If it doesn't bring you joy, if it's not functional, yeah. 
that uh, reevaluate. Thank you, Linda, for share that. I think that can use for many ways, like you said, even relationship, if the relationship is already end, not good, why you keep keeping keeping that relationship, then hold your arm to find that not a new relationship. Of course, not say everybody have to break up. <laughs> but <laughs> just say, you know, sometimes move on. I think a lot, a lot of time people stay in the place hold the back couldn't move forward because something is they couldn't release that hold on the back even the like you said environment maybe they want that the house is already maybe not very good feng shui or very good energy there but they for some reason they want holding right or yes. maybe they go into the new house they didn't know so there is the question come up with you linda so Give us a little bit of insight is if someone move into the new place, doesn't, doesn't matter if it's a bad house or it's rented house, they live in the new place, they want to start the life. So what is the first number one thing they need to know about the feng shui? All right. Well, I'm going to tell you one more story about that briefly, just to let I you know. I love your I stories. <laughs> I have so many stories. Well. The house that I moved in, there's the house that I lived in when I found out about my son dying. And then I moved into another house and I was going through a divorce. I didn't have any money. And a realtor said that I could rent this house. It was four bedrooms, two bath for about $200 a month. And I knew I could find $200. He said, but you need to know the previous owner shot his wife in the house and then oh he killed God. himself in the house. I'm going, Oh my goodness. But you know, I knew about feng shui at the time. So I, the first thing I did was I opened up all the doors and windows. I went through and swept the house energetically. You know, I literally pushed things out. Okay. Now, if you have a singing bowl or a bell, you can certainly go through the house with something like that. What you want to do is to shake up the energy, or you can go with uh, some uh, sage to smudge the house or just some flowers or a candle. It doesn't make any difference. It's more the intention and having the mindset that what you are doing is you're shining the light of a higher power in the space, or you're shaking up the energy and getting rid of it, or you're burning things up so that, you know, whatever terminology or visualization you can come up with, go through the house, having the doors and windows open if you possibly can, and move that energy out and then bring something that has some special meaning to you. Maybe it's a heart, maybe it, it's some fresh flowers or a plant. Um, maybe it is a picture of you and a loved one. Um, it could be, maybe you have a pet, maybe you bring your pet in as the mm. next step. So what you've done is you removed the negative energy. And the first thing that you're doing is you're bringing love and a, the light of a higher power into the space. Then there's a whole bunch of other things that you can do. I actually have a course that if you're interested, you can go to my website and con or contact me. And it's on how to do space clearings and home blessings. And you might want to consider something like that as well. But that will get you started. And that's all I knew at the time was uh, I really hadn't gone through some house like that that was that bad in, of energy. And I cleared it and I brought in what was very, very important to me. You know, I, at the time I had four cats and my daughter and we moved into this house and it, it almost immediately felt like home. And you could just tell that that other energy was gone because there was so much love and so much appreciation and gratitude for having my own place. Um, that you can shift the energy just by having that gratitude. That's beautiful. Thank you, Linda, for sharing that wonderful tips. If you <laughs> are here listening this podcast or watching our podcast show, so here is a tip Linda gave to you. If you move to any new place or going to some place, you start and restart your life, or maybe going to some place is brand new for you, or maybe you want to move or rent the place. So start the first sense. Maybe you're burning some stage around there or running some bill around there or open all of the windows, let the, the flow go through with that. Is that something I'm missing, Linda? 
No, that's perfect. You know, you want the fresh air. The words feng shui refer to wind and water. So feng is wind, shui is water. So bringing in the wind, the air, is one of the best ways that you can energize the space the way that you want to. And then water, that's another possibility. Water equates to both health and wealth. So you might want to bring in a bowl of water, um, a little fountain, or as I said earlier, maybe just some cut flowers in a bowl uh, or a vase with some water. The That's main thing about that water, make sure that it's yeah. clean. <laughs> <laughs> I talk about the water, you know, I'm the Ayurvedic educator also. So we talk about the water energy. The water also bring a lot of nurturing, you know, yes. nurturing, wealthy, healthy then to your life. Then they have many different ways. Thank you, Linda. This is wonderful have you been here. So before we uh, we leave close this uh, podcast interview, tell us what is the best way to uh, to find you. I know I will be posted all of your information on that uh, on under this. Also, do you have another way how people can you prefer that people can contact you with that way? Okay, so I have the website, lindalenore.com. And by all means, go to that. Uh, there's different things that are freebies. There's some, tells you a little bit about some of the classes that I have and so on. And if you need to reach me, email me, lynda at lindalenore.com. One of the miracles, one of the most wonderful things about feng shui that I've discovered is all you have to do is to start thinking about it and it shifts the energy. So if you think that you need some help and you think of me, we automatically are starting to move that energy. Then just reach out and let me know what it is we need to do so that I can either put you on my altar or if we need to have a conversation to see if we can help you in some other way, I'll be glad to do that. So Linda at lindalenore.com or my website, lindalenore.com. Thank you, Linda. So great to have you. Thank you, everybody, to watch our podcast. If you have the story you want to share, please contact me. You know, this is the place for us to share our wisdom, to share our tips, to share our healings. I believe just by sharing that is already bring the healing to the world. Thank you, everyone. I will be see you next Tuesday.